All right, good afternoon. Welcome to the May 21st mini confab meeting. Uh, beautiful day out, beautiful weather. Looks like our weekend should hopefully improve and uh, start seeing the sun out again. Uh, happy to report uh, 11th week in a row, no cases of COVID here, either with our staff or our residents. Um, thank you for all you do to keep us in that position and keep us marching forward. Um, Virginia, for those of you who have not noticed, in the last couple of days uh, has been in either the top five or top ten with number of new cases across the country. Uh, today, somewhat of a rather alarming number of, between yesterday and today, 1,229 new cases. Uh, as of this report, I think Virginia may have had the most new cases of any state. Uh, not all the states had reported yet, but um, a little disturbing and concerning. Um, when we were writing this report yesterday, uh, we were saying that the number of confirmed cases in Virginia was still dropping slowly uh, from May 1st to May 13th a week ago. Uh, there is a little delay in reporting, as I mentioned, but the trend is in the right direction uh, until today, and I'm not sure, I haven't seen uh, why such a large uptick. I think today's number is uh, nearly 200 more than the previously reported high for the state of Virginia. For the Central Virginia Health District, consisting of Lynchburg, the countings of Bedford, Campbell, Appomattox, and Amherst, the number of new cases is still increasing in the past week, but has been at a much lower rate, or not, has been at a lower rate than the previous week. Uh, Lynchburg has held constant for the past three days at 75 cases, and the district has increased by 10 cases since last Thursday to a total of 179 cases. Um, only increased by one new case in Amherst yesterday, so those numbers are starting to get more of a trickle rather than uh, growing larger quickly. We've said we're waiting for the area of the state to remain without any new confirmed cases for 14 days until we relax our guidelines for independent living, assuming the governor has relaxed the guidelines for the state. Healthcare and assisted living areas are tightly controlled by CMS and we follow their regulations with no visitors still at this time. We do not have any restrictions on independent living resident, uh, residents traveling within our local area, but prefer they limit themselves to essential trips, wear masks, strongly adhere to social distance requirements. Our biggest risk is that the virus is brought back to WC by either residents or staff. At present, we quarantine residents that have medical procedures. Right now, most of that uh, has been up to five, has been five days now, um, any surgical procedures, medical procedures and residents that travel outside the area, the places where the virus is active or take public transportation uh, could have quarantine up to 14 days, depending on if you were to go to a hot spot or take public transportation. So um, I know there were some questions already uh, from our communication yesterday, but the traveling again, um, as long as you are going to somewhere that is open, um, we are fine with that. We ask you to be careful. Um, our staff have the same guidelines that uh, if they can drive somewhere and uh, go to a place that's not considered a hot spot, I don't believe we're saying anywhere in the state of Virginia uh, or heading down probably towards the Carolinas or hot spots uh, at this point in time, but if that changes, we will try to get that out and uh, would appreciate you taking an abundance of caution in anything you do when you leave here, uh, as well as things you're doing around campus here. Uh, as mentioned earlier, visitation for the healthcare area still is closed, and we'll talk a little more about that uh, with some of the questions we have. There is... Um, new guidance coming out about testing and what that could look like for our campus. Um, CMS is asking to have testing done across the campus uh, in healthcare, um, assisted living. We don't know how that will transition over to independent living, but if we're gonna be testing some, we'd like to test all, but we're not sure, one, how we're gonna get tests, 
that has not been shared with us. Um, but there are some talks right now that we would actually do a baseline test, test all of our residents in at least healthcare and assisted living, and then there's interest in testing our staff actually on a weekly basis. Um, but again, I, I don't believe at this point in time the state has enough testing kits to be able to do that. There's also another provision that these tests would have to come back within 48 hours and um, trying to get all that done uh, on a large scale is pretty difficult. So uh, there's a lot of uh, meetings going on right now with the Department of Health to figure out how that would happen across the state. If you look just at Westminster Canterbury alone and you took everyone who lives here and works here, we would be talking about potentially testing 900 people at one time. Uh, from what I've heard from other campuses, that is not something that could be achieved in one day, even with the National Guard. So um, again, there needs to be a lot more uh, clarification on sharing how that will work out. Someone has also asked, uh, when I was in a meeting yesterday, if antibody testing would be done or could be done at that same time. And uh, the Department of Health said that there's not enough information yet on the antibody testing on uh, will a positive test that you have been exposed to the virus mean that you have protection against reinfection. Uh, there's still some questioning on that. While it does look positive that that is a good chance that it would protect against reinfection, there is no uh, good data saying how long that protection could last. So still a lot of unknowns that we are waiting to have answers for. And then again, uh, the independent living portion, uh, would, would we be able to test everyone at that time? We would certainly ask for that, but um, have no guarantees there. I'm gonna let Judy come talk a little bit about some of the things going on in dining, and then I have different questions that I'll be asking, uh, answering, and uh, would ask if you have some questions, please call 6304. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just a couple of things wanted to address. Um, I might have been in the newsletter, but I just want to let everybody know that the dining committee and I started a Skype call. We did that earlier in the week, so we've got some um, great ongoing conversations going. Uh, regarding Memorial Day on Monday, we um, have, if you haven't already gotten the menu, there's a special Memorial Day box coming out. Um, you can order that in advance. The cafe will be open from 11.30 to 1.30, so if you don't want something as large as what's on the, that menu, you're welcome to come by and get some soup or salads. Also on Monday, um, if, you, if it's your, your scheduled day to put in your grocery order, we ask that you try to get it in by noon instead of four, if possible. There might be, there, some of the discussion that I had with the, the uh, dining committee was that um, you probably are hearing in the news about uh, there are still some delays or changes in some of the purchasing guidelines, um, especially on some of the proteins. We are in constant conversation with um, our major purveyors, um, sometimes daily. And we just wanted to let people know that there may occasionally be a change in a recipe. I know that there were a lot of disappointed people last week one night when we didn't get the ribs. We uh, had to substitute a, a nice pork loin for that and we apologize. But we will do the best that we can with um, what we're able. It's, it's been interesting to learn how that whole supply chain, um, how that, what has affected that supply chain. Much of it just being that um, shift from selling product to small restaurants. Um, with all of them gone, and with a lot of the college campuses and a lot of the large campuses closed, uh, the inventory of a lot of that product has, has changed. Um, we've noticed um, that on occasion we might get something that is a frozen product versus a fresh product. Um, so please let us know if you're feeling that you're um, seeing anything unusual. Otherwise, I promise nobody's going to go hungry. We might just be um, having a different recipe now and then. Um, and I, you probably have, many of you may have known that, for instance, um, Tyson has a big chicken plant, um, processing plant outside of Amarillo, Texas, and they just in the last week tested um, over 100, 700 people positive in that community. I was listening to an NPR with the, uh, the mayor of that community. So you can imagine the impact that that has not only on that processing plant for that community. Um, and again, as more testing is made available, those numbers are going to be going up. But those are the kinds of things that are also affecting a lot of our product supply. 
Otherwise, again, we just want to thank you dearly. Uh, we know that this is um, stretching on and the novelty of some of the things that we've been trying to do is starting to wear off. Uh, we just ask for your continued patience and um, encouragement and support. Thank you all. Bye. All right, so I will get to some of the questions that I've had come in over the past couple of days. Uh, there was a question or a clarification on grocery pickup or groceries on Monday the 25th for Memorial Day. And uh, I guess there was something in the campus update. We will not be picking up from Kroger or Walmart uh, trying to get our staff as many as we can all for Memorial Day. So no pickup for Kroger or Walmart on Monday. Uh, also do not plan to have the drop off from two to four over on the memory support area from uh, on Monday as well. So Monday, uh, we will have grocery orders through the dining area from Cafe uh, for Woods Edge and Creekside, but uh, we'll not have the two to four drop off or Kroger or Walmart. Want to also clarify that um, you know, if someone in independent living goes out and does have a surgery or a medical procedure, comes back, there's a five-day isolation. Uh, there's no isolation going out to a doctor's appointment, going out to a dentist appointment uh, for various things like that at this point. We do ask you, if you are able to, to try to, uh, if you're able to have a tele uh, telehealth conference with your doctor rather than going to an office, uh, sometimes that's easier said than done. But uh, if you're able to do that, we would ask for you to please do that. Um, so answer that question. Someone asks, when, uh, when will residents likely hear how the pandemic has affected Westminster Canterbury's financials? We've talked a little bit about that, and uh, this person brings up a good point about when is our next resident finance committee meeting. So um, our month of March financials are in and have been in for some time. Those were strong. Uh, we were better than budget for our bottom line and very fortunate, but also that was just the front end of all this starting. So Paul is in the process now with Melinda and her team of getting financials put together for April, and we'll hopefully start seeing those numbers come in um, with a little more uh, completeness coming in next week. And preliminarily, we think that those numbers should be pretty good. Um, it's interesting. We've never been through a period where people are not allowed to take uh, much in the way of time off. Uh, time off results a lot of the times in people having to work overtime to cover people's shifts that are out. So um, that has been an interesting uh, tweak to our financials that has actually been positive when we look at uh, payroll even though we've kept everyone on campus but are not running all of our operations. So uh, we think that April is going to be in pretty good shape. We can't say that with certainty, but uh, what we will try to do here in the next few days is plan a finance meeting, and uh, Paul and I will get up here and tag team that show and uh, try to let you know where we stand. We have talked a little bit before about the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, I think I let you know last week that our board voted to keep that money at this point. And um, we will go through the process of spending that money. And um, we understand the worst thing that could come out of this is that we would have to pay that money back uh, with a 1% interest rate. And uh, we feel like what we're going through with this uh, uncertainty, economic uncertainty that we're facing, that it's uh, important to keep that money in case anything comes up. So uh, that obviously helps us, also gives us a little more liquidity to handle anything that may come up. Question is, has the pandemic affected new admissions, both to independent living and to health services? Um, with independent living, I would say the answer is no, for the most part. People that were planning to move in in April, uh, and I think maybe one or two in March, moved in. Um, very quickly, we put a process in place where those folks were not able to travel prior to, I think, seven days coming in. Um, or maybe 14 days coming in, but seven to five, five to seven days prior, we're taking their uh, temperatures, reporting those to us and keeping isolated. And then when they moved on to campus, we're isolated in apartments. So uh, not the best way to move into Westminster and not the most welcoming way. We appreciate those people who did move in their flexibility and um, have people lined up to move in here over the next coming months as well. 
Uh, we're trying to work with a very limited number of movers as we've had to move uh, some folks in and out and around campus and uh, making sure that we're screening those folks wearing masks and trying to stay out of common areas as much as possible. So um, been very vigilant with that. In the healthcare areas for probably at least a month, we did not admit anyone that was not a Westminster Canterbury resident into the healthcare center. Uh, once we had word that Centro was starting to utilize COVID tests for people, we would then uh, wait to get a negative test and then started some uh, limited amount of admissions into our healthcare center for rehab. So for the past probably three, almost at least three weeks now, I would say we've had people moving into healthcare uh, on short-term stays. Had another question, um, I think that came in from a Canterbury Club or Azalea Plan resident asking, would we require, once there is a vaccine, that would we require everyone to receive a vaccine? And what has been our uh, conversations on campus about that? And frankly, uh, there have not been any conversations with our staff about vaccines. Obviously, I know everyone was excited or at least Wall Street was at the start of this week with some trials on vaccines. Uh, and it kind of cooled off a little bit by the middle of this week. But um, we have no idea whether there's going to be a vaccine towards the middle or end of the year or next year and how that will play out. So we really have not had any conversations, have not heard of any conversations within our, business, our, our industry as to how we would uh, have vaccinations require vaccinations. And um, the person, I guess, was saying that we don't require everyone to get an influenza A vaccination, and would we require a vaccination for uh, COVID-19? And um, we'll wait and see once we know more about that. And hopefully that's a discussion we have sooner rather than later, because that means that uh, there's progress on that front. So the next one here is how many independent living residents have spouses in health care? There are 10 people that live in apartments or cottages that have loved ones up in health care. There are also an additional four people in assisted living, so 14 spouses upstairs. The visitor policy is, uh, the no visitor policy has placed them in tremendous hardship. What is Westminster Canterbury doing to ease this? Um, we continue to have the availability of working, whether it's FaceTime, Skype, uh, trying to get loved ones across uh, the entire health uh, campus of the 84 people in healthcare and 50 plus people in assisted living linked with their loved ones uh, through that face-to-face -face time. Um, we try to do the best we can with um, probably at least five staff members that are helping each day connect residents. Uh, obviously the phones for those that are able to is, is another way um, but it is difficult, and um, I, uh, the word here, tremendous hardship, is well said. Uh, as I said earlier, Center for Medicare Services requires that there are no visitors at this time, and um, there's some conversation about what that looks like when we reopen. I think the government is saying it's going to be up to the state of Virginia as to when things open and how visitation will look. Um, it's hard to see across our state how that would happen, whether it would be regionally or not, because there are still a lot of our colleagues that are dealing with many hardships with uh, outbreaks and facilities across the state of Virginia and many other places that's uh, widely publicized. So um, we don't have timelines yet for that. That will certainly be something that opens up, I would think, after phase three. And um, Unfortunately, I believe that's rightfully so because it is our most vulnerable population with a lot of people that have multiple illnesses in there and are high risk. Um, the thought of having to go 14 days without a new case is uh, much too stringent in our health district. Uh, this could go on for a very long time uh, into next year, the year after, and um, that is correct. That is a high bar trying to find 14 days of no cases. Uh, at this point, we've had some conversations involving uh, some residents in this and our staff. Uh, we're gonna start out with that high bar. We'll reevaluate as time goes on. Um, 
I would rather be on the side of caution and back off rather than start out with a low bar and open things up prematurely um, dealing with uh, and, and have to deal with some problems because of that. So um, we will watch that. I think uh, the, the person who inquired about this is correct. It is uh, potential for a long time before reopening. Again, we will um, continue to talk with the other Westminster Canterbury's colleagues across the state. Uh, I have friends back in other state, uh, state of North Carolina that I've been in contact with throughout this. And um, we sent out our plan the other day. And uh, I was glad because that has triggered some of the other campuses to start sharing uh, their plans as well. And they are all trying to formulate their ideas on how do you reopen. It's interesting, there is at least three Westminster Canterbury's that have not allowed their independent living residents to leave their campus at all. Um, we have certainly let our folks uh, come and go uh, and ask them to do it carefully. Um, even though we've always said the governor for the longest time asked us to stay at home, uh, his message now is still a safer at home. So it's not come and go as you please, but uh, be more careful doing it and try to stay at home. But also a lot of campuses, people that I, I speak with, do not have their pool open, do not have their wellness centers open, um, have been only meal delivery a number of places where we've tried to have opportunities for people to be out and do things, uh, I think a little more liberally than some other campuses. So um, we're gonna continue to watch what's happening here, also try to take best practices from other places and uh, try to collaborate with them and figure out the best way to try to do this safely. <laughs> Angela, is there a question? The definition of isolation versus quarantine, someone asked. Uh, I apologize for interchanging those. I would say they are the same thing. If you are isolated, you are quarantined. So um, again, if, if you travel on a ship tomorrow and you go, you're going to come back 14 days of being in your room, isolated into your room. We will serve you meals and uh, I, I use them the same way, and I may be mistaken when I do that, but uh, I think they're the same thing for the most part. I'll probably have an email when I get back in my office telling me where I messed up, but sorry. Good question, but thank you for asking. Um, so lastly, uh, we just ask again, as we go through, uh, we're starting to hear more people ask, can I go here, can I go there? Um, I've, I've had some neat stories that uh, I hope are happening more often than, than not, where a couple of people have gone to visit families at their homes. And um, I've had some people tell me that your families have said, you know, we're going to stay out here. We're all going to sit outside spaced well. Uh, you're not coming into my house, but I will serve you a meal. You can eat out here. We'll talk. And then you can leave and go back to Westminster. Um, it's a good clean way of doing things, and I appreciate those stories. It's good to hear, uh, and I hope that's happening more often than I know for those that do leave campus. Um, but again, would ask you to have an abundance of caution in everything you are doing uh, here on campus and if you do decide to leave campus. Uh, we all have a personal responsibility, and um, making sure that you are careful because you affect the people that you're going to come across. Uh, just remember that. Again, the governor saying safer at home. Uh, would ask people to wear masks. We are starting to uh, place more surgical masks downstairs at the front check-in desk and would ask for people to keep wearing masks. I know that there are a number uh, of you that don't like to wear masks. Um, I'm sorry. I think you should. Uh, there are a number of campuses that are saying it's mandatory as they reopen their campuses that you wear a mask. We are not requiring as mandatory, but I am strongly recommending that you wear a mask. Uh, I think you place a person in a difficult position when you decide to sit on an elevator and not wear a mask for the person that gets on and needs to go upstairs. Um, I guess I would say if you don't want to wear a mask and you want to get upstairs, then use the stairwell. Um, and for those of you that need to get up four or five flights without your mask, that's, I guess, um, that's something I'd recommend. But I, I would ask you not to place your neighbors 
uh, the, it, in a position to have an awkward opportunity when they get on the elevator if you're just standing there smiling at them without a mask. Um, when you wear a mask, I hate to say this, if you're wearing a mask and it doesn't cover your mouth, that's not helping. If it doesn't cover your nose, it's not helping. Um, if you're going to put a mask on, please cover your face, cover your chin, cover your mouth, cover your nose. Um, would ask you again, social distancing. I know it's easier said than done in various places. Uh, some of you, many of you, many of you have been great. Um, whether it's a happy hour out in a, a area, outside, inside, um, I appreciate your spacing. Keep doing that. This is something that's going to be going on for a long time. And then infection prevention. Uh, I know there's some stories out this week that the CDC is maybe saying we're not going to pick up this virus from contact um, of surfaces as much as we originally thought, but um, would still ask you to continue washing your hands. We're going to continue cleaning surfaces in places like elevator buttons and doorknobs and door handles and things like that. So I uh, ask you to please be careful in touching your face, your eyes, your nose, your mouth, and uh, just continue being vigilant. So. Thank you again for all you do. Um, it's helpful to have these questions prior to the call so we can try to get some answers for you. We'll continue doing this and uh, hope you all have a nice Memorial Day. Thank you.